If you can imagine being dead, if you can put yourself in that place, it's liberating. What a moment. Al Gart, thank you so much. This book is out and you can get it. Creative Loitering Podcast. I have a degree in philosophy. I studied the arguments for and against the existence of God. It goes around in a circle. Part of me recognized this is God. There was no doubt in my mind. It's like you're being reunited with someone. If someone doesn't want to believe it, they will find a reason not to believe it. So you talk about Siddhartha did not want to share that experience because Siddhartha did not believe it could be verbally communicated. I tried to go into it in the first chapter, I think it's chapter four, the first, uh, what I call the first encounter or visitation, where there were no words. It was just, uh, it's a very strange thing, but there was a, what I, the only thing, the word that I could use to describe it would be a communion, which would be a melding, a joining. Uh, so there's no distance. There's no distance between you and the thing that is there. So it's not like there's me and then there's God. There's just God. And that's it. There's no separation. Now, I'm part of the thing that's happening, right? Because I'm experiencing it. But I'm not the entire story, right? I'm part of a story of what's happening. And I'm watching the, um, the, the event that's taking place. It's like a, a tingling. It's like a joyful light thing happening. And I could feel that happening in nature. That the nature was responding to this thing. It wasn't just me. It wasn't just God. It was everything was responding to this moment. And I could see why it would be very hard to put that in. There's no way to to put it into words. But I tried the best I could because that's what I've done for a living, right? I've worked with words. So I said, if anyone's going to try to put this to words, I guess I could try. And so I did. I did, I, I did try to explain it and describe it the same I would, as I would describe, you know, Chin Giganti being pushed into a wheelchair into the courtroom, you know what I mean, to face the judge. I would just describe what I saw and what I felt and what I heard. And, you know, and I tried to do that in the book because I thought it might be a service to people who are looking for God, but maybe they, they expect God to be a certain way. They might, you know, they might be limited in what they think. They might think, I'm going to hear a man's voice, you know, Johnny, this is God, you know. Or they, or they might look in and think they're going to see, you know, the burning bush or something. Or, you know, they may have some preconceived notion of what it's going to be like. So I thought, let me let me just, you know, try the best I can with the limitation of words to express what happened. And like I said, the, there was, there was a, a communication that took place, right? There was a sharing, but there was no words. It wasn't like, you know, hello, my name is Harry, and I happen to be God. But, but there was definitely an entity. There was definitely a presence. And the, this, this entity knew who I was. I was no stranger to this thing. I was not like, you know, being introduced to something like new. I recognized who it was. Part of me recognized this is God. There was no doubt in my mind. So there's something inside of us that will reverberate, that will recognize this thing. It's not like foreign. It's not like you're going to meet an alien that's totally different from you, and right. you're not going to recognize it's going to have green skin. And you know, It's something that you will be very at home with and is very at home with you, and you could you know, just share without speaking. Uh, which is an interesting thing because I, I, I put an excerpt of it somewhere and uh, this FBI agent I know saw it and said, and got back to me, sent me a text. He said he read it and he had, he had come, been shot and he, was, he, he told the story. He had been shot. He was on an operating table and he left his body and he went somewhere else. Right, and the doctors are working to save his life, and he came upon these two spiritual beings. He didn't describe them to me, but 
It's in the text. Two spiritual beings, and that's how they communicated with each other. They never opened their mouths. They never said a word. But they were looking at each other, and then they looked at him, and they communicated to him that he had to go back. But it was no words. It was just a, a, a means of communication by some other way where you just know. You just know what they're telling you. And they know what they're telling each other. And there's no, there's no room for inter, uh, misinterpretation because with words, they can be misconstrued, right? You can use a word the wrong way or someone can interpret it differently. This is very streamlined communication. It's like, boom, it's imparted. More like telepathy. Yeah. So that was, the, that was what the experience was like. It was just like, it happened. I got some information from it. I have a feeling of that tingling, you know, that, that love and that tingling and that joy, that, that presence. It was very high. I don't know how to describe it. You know, talk about heaven being up in the sky. I can understand why people would associate it with that because it's very high energy. It's a very high energy, like intelligence and uplifting and happy and joyful as if there's not, not a care in the world. It's just pure joy. And that's who I am and that's who you are because you come from me. And it's just communicated. And there's no, like I said, there's no way to misinterpret it. And it's like, okay, so that's, who, so I have nothing to worry about in this world. There's no reason for me to worry anymore. So I came off that, that experience. It's like, you know, my life changed. It changed. And, you know, um, I wasn't the same. A friend of mine, the Joe, he says, you know, he he saw me afterward sometime. He says he knew something, uh, I forget the word he used, but, you know, something significant had happened from before he knew me and after that. You know, he saw a, a profound difference in me from then. So, you know, is it real? Is it not real? You know, I can only talk about the results, The you know. You know what I mean? I can only tell you my experience. I can't tell you, you know, is it going to happen to everyone? Is it real? Is it not real? Am I trying to prove the existence of God or not? You know, I went into that in the introduction. I'm not interested in that. I would studied that already. I went, I studied, I have a degree in philosophy. I studied arguments for and against the, the existence of God. It goes around in a circle because it's stuck within logic and reason. It just goes around and around. So you can, Raise an argument, counter argument. Raise another argument, counter argument. Raise another argument, counter argument. It goes nowhere. No one's going to be convinced by just pure reason and logic. It's not going to happen. If someone doesn't want to believe it, they will find a reason not to believe it. If somebody wants to believe it, they're going to find a reason to believe it. So I wanted to get beyond that. I wanted to get, look, listen, we're not talking about does God exist or not. We're not talking about this, right? I'm just going to tell you what happened to me, right? I'm going to tell you what I think about it. I'm going to tell you what I think about all of the beliefs that can come out of divine visitation, right? And and the the limitations of beliefs. And someone asked me the other day, and I said, you know, I don't actually believe in God. I said, what are you talking about? You just wrote a book about God. I said, I don't believe in God. Because you believe in something that you don't know. You believe in something that you haven't experienced, right? That's what belief is, right? I believe this to be true. But if it's true, you no longer have to believe in it, do you? You're one of the few people who doesn't need to have faith. Basically, that's what I'm saying. That's what makes it unique. You're probably one of the only people in human history to professionally write about an experience like this. Yeah. And I found myself wondering how much was lost in the translation in all these other stories that we hear by these non-professionals right. who have been uh, misquoted and mistranslated over mm -hmm. hundreds and thousands of years. I'm thinking about that a lot lately um, because of, look at Jesus. Jesus was uh, approached at night by... Uh, a Pharisee 
kind of believed that Jesus might be the Messiah, but he had so much at stake, reputation and the other people, you know, the Romans, you know, he, he didn't want to upset the apple cart, but personally he believed he could be. So he arranged a meeting at night with Jesus, and Jesus was sitting across from him and talking, and talking, talking shop, religious shop, whatever. And uh, finally Jesus told him, you know, you have to be born again. What are you talking about? My mother's dead. I can't possibly be born again. I can't go back in her womb. It's impossible. Because Jesus says, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about be born of the Spirit. Right? Now, how has that been interpreted? That's been interpreted as you have to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That's how it's interpreted. To be born again, you, you profess Jesus as my Lord and Savior. But is that what Jesus was talking about? Or is that the misinterpretation or, or an interpretation that came down and has been misconstrued? Because the idea of being born again if you look from spiritual uh, uh, spiritual perspective, you look at Krishnamurti, you look at uh, Buddha, you look at these people, they talked about dying to the known, dying to your old self, dying to your old belief systems, you know, uh, detachment, right? Not being attached to things, right? So the way I look at it, what Jesus was trying to say and what I'm saying when, when we talk about going beyond the sphere is to be born spiritually, right? To be born, you were born from your mother's womb, right? So when you were in her womb, you weren't able to touch your mother's face, right? You weren't able to drink milk from her breast. You weren't able to run around and play, right? But you could feel things, right? You did have senses and you could hear things. But are you experiencing and hearing and, and the fullness of life in your mother's womb? Absolutely not. You're getting a little bit, right? Just getting a little bit of taste of what life is when you're in your mother's womb. When you come out, some pe you know, I would say people cry when they come out because they don't want to come out. They're afraid of coming out. They're in there. They're comfortable. Everything's okay. And now I'm being forced, forced, pushed out into this new place, right? Traumatic. It's traumatic, for sure. And you come out into this new place, and now it's a whole different world, right? Now you can see colors. Right? And you can hear the birds singing, and you can taste food, and you can run, and you can use your hands and grab things, and you can make things, and you have, you have so much more of an experience of life, right? Life is much richer now than it was before. So when I say... When I see Jesus talking about being born again, what I see is being born spiritually. Like to go beyond this limitations that we have set for ourselves. Like I'm Joe, uh, I was born in Brooklyn. Uh, I have a degree in, you know, plumbing. Uh, what, you know, who I, am, I think I am. And my mother is so-and-so, my father, and I have three children, and this is who I am. I'm saying when you're born again, spiritually when you go beyond these things life becomes a richer experience you get more out of a sim simple thing i'll give you an example uh, not long ago I, I was taking a hot bath right my wife's always pushing me when i was working at the hotel i'd put in long hours and hard work and because uh, i do the maintenance and so you know, you have to have a hot bath. You have a. I never take them. I was like, ah, I don't have time for that. Take a shower. So this one time, I said, you know what? You're right. I'm gonna have a hot bath this time. Fill the tub with hot water. Throw some stuff in there, whatever. Epsom salt, and you know, it's a clawfoot, old clawfoot tub, an old house I have, right? And uh, I get into the hot hot tub, and and I started to imagine, like, wow. Uh, how much had to happen for me to be in this hot tub? So iron had to be pulled out of the earth, melted to make this tub. Copper had to be pulled out of the earth to make the pipes. A well, I have a dug well. Men had to come on this property and dig 80 feet down. And then 
at some point they retrofitted a pump to pump the water in because they used to get the water from outside. So they had to, and they had to, so men had to come and carry this tub, right? Then they had to put plumbing into the house and, you know, sweat pipe and all the things that had, and then a furnace had to be made, designed by engineers, made, brought into this house and set up, installed. Uh, oil tank had to be made and put in the house and then the pipes put in so we could have, oil had to be brought here, trucks had to, bring, and I was thinking, all this stuff, all this effort, all of this went into so that I could have this moment to just have a hot bath. And I felt like so unworthy of having this hot bath, you know, because of all of the people and all the work, you know, and all of the technology and the mines and, and the labor, the, the laborers carrying this 250 pound tub or whatever it weighed and bringing it into this house, you know, all of that. So, you know, when you when you think when you get beyond your limitations and you start to search and your mind is capable of amazing things, you can see so much more in just a simple thing. And you can appreciate something so much more. Now someone else would just say, I deserve this hot bath and I don't you know, and that's it. And I'm gonna sit here and enjoy my hot bath. But no appreciation. You see? So that so I think that the, the rebirth that we talk about being reborn, I think there's been a misinterpretation. Again, because some of these people are not here to defend themselves and what they meant, right? So what, I, what I'm trying in some ways to do with this book is also to say, you know what? This is what I experienced. Take it or leave it. I don't care. It's up to you. Uh, this is what I think God is about and who we're about. And, you know, it may differ. It may overlap with some other stuff. But this is where I'm coming from. Uh, and... You know, I, I, I don't have any stake in it. I just wanted to get it out. I just want to get it out of my system. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is now, and I never talked about this yet, but since I've told those stories, those stories don't have the same weight uh, on me as they, they did before. Mm -hmm. It's almost like I've given them. I've given them and I don't carry it around, you know, like I did before, which is sad in a way because I, there was something that I was holding on to, you know. But now I've just given it away, and 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 then and I uh, wonder, like, well, you know, should I have done it? You know, should I have done it? Because uh, I felt like, but I think you know, good things will come of it. So uh, it's out there, and that's it. Maybe you'll hear someone say, uh, "Al, I had an experience very much like the one that you described, but I didn't have the words to describe it." Mm -hmm. I have I've had some people um, uh, find it relatable. That's the, the term they use. Yeah. They've used a few times. It is very relatable. They've had some kind of experience that it kind of uh, this reading this reinforced that it wasn't something weird. It wasn't something that they, you know, didn't it didn't really happen. You know, they're they're, they're looking back on their own experience and saying, oh, you know, maybe that's something. Well, the best most of us can do is just say we were aware of an indescribable presence. Mm -hmm. It's true. I mean, it could ha like I say, it could happen just looking at the snow. It could happen anywhere at any time, you know, uh, and just like being open to, to that possibility, you know, is, is, is a lot, you know. It could happen anywhere at any time. It could, you know, I devoted a chapter to music uh, because – after those experiences, I found that God would reach me through music. So I would hear a song. And one of the songs is in there. It's a Moody Blues song called Watching and Waiting. It's, uh, the lyrics are amazing. Watching and waiting for a friend to play with. Why have I been, here, been alone so long? Uh, and, uh, and then it's like, there's a part where it says, uh, here, there's lots of room for doing everything you've been denied. Look and gather all you want to. There's no one here to stop you. Try. I mean, it's almost as if God wrote those lyrics. If you read it, it's like God is saying, "Why? Well, I'm watching and waiting for you. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm watching and waiting for you. That moment. And Jesus talked about it, too. He said, the, 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 uh, the prodigal son. The prodigal son is the same. It's God is 
missing, you know, that one person, you know, missing, waiting, looking, you know, looking all the time, waiting for that return. Uh, Jesus talked in parables, but it's just a lot of the same things, you know, that I felt happened. Uh, those parables make absolutely perfect sense to me. That when I say the, when that, that first experience happened, that this entity knew who I was. I mean, it was, you know, it's like a reunion. It's a reunion. It's not even like a meeting. It's like you're being reunited with someone. You recognize them. They recognize you. There's no, do you, you know, when, when you see your father or your mother, you see, you know, there's a familiarity. They were gone and now they're back or they've just made themselves more apparent to you or you found a way to be more aware of them. I think they found a way to break through. That's what I think. There was a vulnerability. There was a moment. There was that window. And they were looking and waiting and found that window and broke in. That's it. You know, and, and when that happened, like I said, it's not like a stranger just broke into my house and I'm afraid, right? It's like, oh, yeah, you. It was that, that, that sense of like I recognized who, who it was and they recognized me. And, and, the, and, and that's the other thing, you know, they talk about sometimes like you, you take your shoes off, you know, you have to come to God naked. You know, this kind of idea has been floated out there. Well, there is a nakedness there. There's nothing that you can hide from, from this entity. You know, it, it doesn't matter what bad things you've done. It's not like you could hide it. Because that entity is always watching and always looking. But not with this, like, voyeuristic separation, like with, you know, binoculars feeling what you're feeling, knowing what you're going through, is totally with you. The communion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like the use of that word in this book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's not like the Catholic Church communion, but <laughs> which is, I think, taking away for... I think I enjoyed the contrast, the way you used, you used the word versus mm -hmm. the way we've been, well, led to believe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you call it impartial universal energy. Yeah, that's the Eastern kind of view of what it is. But there's no, uh, there's no personality, there's no entity, there's no recognition of you or that this entity has any kind of its own intelligence or memories. It's, I feel like it's part of the, it's part of it, but it's not the whole thing. There was nothing you could do to make the spirit love you any more or any less. Mm -hmm. so there was no fire and brimstone in this encounter. No. And that's, that's something I wanted to get across because uh, I know my experience, there's nothing that I could do to, to affect this entity uh, in terms of how it felt about me. I mean, I could, I could stab somebody in the heart. It doesn't matter. That wouldn't change that. It might change some other things, right? Somebody died. <laughs> I'm guilty. I go to jail. I feel remorse. I feel guilt. I, you know, whatever. Or, you know, I feel justified because they were bad people. Whatever. That, that goes on. But as far as my creator and how my creator feels about me, that can't be changed. That can't be changed. It's fundamentally there. It's a platform. You can't go below, right? There's no, there's no sinking below this. That love is, that love is guaranteed. And uh, I had to look up the word ebullience. It's quite the wordsmith there. I, yeah. <laughs> this certainly uh, was a very good book. Something worth taking my time with and understanding. It's such a significant encounter and, um, such a relevant topic today. You know, I think you and I were talking on the phone about how the Boston Globe blew the lid off of the whole Catholic Church scandal, which just led to this mass exodus. And so now there's a whole generation of kids who grow up with uh, absolutely no religion, nothing to base a belief on. 
So as I was reading this, I was wondering what someone in that bracket would think. Because they're not overlaying what they were taught against what you just wrote about. So you're saying they're, they're lacking the context of the past. Right. So the, if they're reading this, they're, 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 not, they're not being influenced by something they thought before or they were taught before or some belief they had inherited. Uh, well, and most of us that were raised with Christian faith, if we question something or believe something a little bit different than what we're being taught in Sunday school, we're bad people. We're heathens. Mm -hmm. And so it's just kind of beaten into us not to question that and to follow the herd. Right. And if somebody says something different than what we were taught, we better be careful. I was I was actually called a blasphemer once at, at my dinner table by a pastor because I told him I saw God in this other guy's eyes looking at me. <laughs> you know, because he was... He was the old fire and brimstone pastor, you know, and I, I'd go because my wife wanted to go to church, and I'd listen, and I'm like, I can't stand this stuff. Uh, it's just negative. It's totally negative. It's a, somebody once told me God has the worst public relations, huh. you know, and, and some of these pastors are really doing a bad job in terms of um, if they're trying to represent God. They're doing a very lousy job. They, they, they make God into something that's just uh, terrifying uh, judgmental, hateful, uh, scornful, all of that. And if you don't do this and that and whatever, uh, God has no use for you. I mean, it's just, you, know, you might as well be dead to God. Motivation through fear. Yeah. So when I, when I said, you know, he's trying to convince me, right? He's, he's proselytizing. We had them over for dinner, right? So he's proselytizing. And, and you know, I'm resistant you know, to to uh, some of this stuff. And I just told him, I said, you know, I don't know if we need all of this, you know. I said, I can see God looking at me through Harry right there right now. He said, that's blasphemy. I said, well, didn't Jesus say the same thing? Didn't he say, don't you know that ye are gods? Why is it blasphemy if I say it? Jesus said it. It's okay then, but you don't talk about that. That's not part of your sermon, that each of us are gods. It's not part of your sermon. It's always we're devils. <laughs> you know, we're always going to burn in hell. We're always bad, and we have to, you know, repent and, and get on our hands and knees and beg for forgiveness, and we have to ask for intervention, and we have to ask Jesus to, to, to intercede for us. This is what you're teaching. And I just, you know, I don't see it. I don't see it that way. I'm sorry. I can't see it that way. So don't waste your time with me. Go save someone else. Everything that came out of my mouth was an offense to God, according to him. So I don't know. I might have offended God. I'm sure I offended God a few times in my life, but I'm not worried about whether, whether I'm loved by God. I have no concern of that. That's not, I'm not worried about that. Catholic priest. It wasn't Catholic. No, it was just a Protestant. Something we never heard much about was the, the, the demons or fallen angels. That sort of thing never seemed to come up much. Mm -hmm. And you'd ask about it even a little bit. They just... They probably got scared to death. Well, as I get older and I look back on some of those conversations, like in Sunday school, I realized they just didn't have the answers. And they were just being defensive about not having the answers. That's what was really going on there. I was asking too many questions, and they were just getting frustrated. They want you to have faith. They want you to listen. They want you to absorb these sermons and these teachings. But then if you do take an interest and you start asking the wrong questions, yeah, well, yeah. look what happened to Jesus, right? <laughs> he was yeah. uh, he was killed for a reason, right? They they, they thought he was going to disturb, you know, what they had going there. They had a good situation going, and he was basically questioning the whole thing. Like when they said, uh, you know, these disciples were saying, uh, 
How could you hang out with these people? Do you see what they're eating? They're not eating kosher food. Look at what they're eating. And Jesus says, you know, I'm more concerned with what comes out of your mouth than what goes into it. I mean, that was disturbing the order, right? Because you had to obey all of these things. You couldn't leave anything out. But he was saying, what's the big deal? So they eat something I don't eat. That doesn't mean I'm more concerned when people talk about other people, right? Or they preach something that's a lie. I'm more concerned with what's coming out of their mouth than what's going in. Because it's what's, what, what, does, what defiles a man is what comes out, not what goes in. It's an actual, from the Bible, right? it, what defiles a person is not what goes into their mouth, it's what comes out. So you know, when w- even Jesus was a blasphemer. I mean, you know, that's what they called him. He was a blasphemer. He said he was the son of God. I mean, <laughs> goodbye, you're done. We're done talking. You're the son of God. Obviously, you are a devil, and you're casting out devils because you're the boss of the devils. That's what they said. Right? So you can't win that argument with those people. I think it took uh, a, a little bit of a humbling is the wrong word, of the church, which again started in 2001, I think. But now, um, like if I go to church with my family around Christmas, if I go home for Christmas, uh, we'll talk to the the pastors at one of those more uh, non-denominational churches, and they're so much more accepting. Mm -hmm. And they'll come right out and say it uh, right away. uh, They're not there to judge what you believe or what you don't believe. And you're welcome to be here and believe what you want to believe, and they're going to mm-hmm. share what they believe, and let's talk about it. Mm-hmm. You know, there's uh, no one's uh, being persecuted for mm-hmm. questioning or presenting a different uh, point of view because okay. that's how you keep your membership at an acceptable level where you can keep the lights on uh, and you know, it's unfortunate in a lot of ways. The church did a lot of good for communities and continues to. But, yeah, a lot was uh, thrown out with the bathwater, I think, in the last 20 years. Well, speaking of bathwater, I was once questioned uh, by a, a Catholic priest about my beliefs about baptism. And uh, I knew I didn't want to answer these questions, but they insisted, you know. So I said, well, you know, I don't know, you know, that I believe in this baptism. Why not? I said, well, I don't know that I believe children are born evil. Well, the Bible, you know, I said, well, yeah. I said, I, I don't know even that Jesus existed. Honestly, I, you know, I do now, but back then I was like, I, I don't even know. I never met him. I from my own personal experience. I, I don't know if Jesus existed or he didn't exist. And I don't know that children are born evil. I think we, we if anything, they start out pretty innocent and then they get corrupted by us. You know, they, we make them bad. He says, well, you have no integrity. I said, okay. I guess I have no integrity, according to you. But, you know, it was just that was the, the way the conversation went because I didn't say what I was supposed to say, which is, yes, I believe in baptism, and yes, pe- people are, you know, children are born evil, and so on and so forth. So I, uh, I just questioned all that. I was probably 19 at the time, but I questioned it. And uh, for that, I, I was basically told I couldn't even participate in the, in the baptism of a child. I was made to sit in that. <laughs> well, <laughs> the back. now, wasn't that back when most of us were under enormous pressure by our family and our communities and often even our, um, our jobs to participate in the church and go along? I was definitely being pushed to go along, and, you know, I tried. Yeah. But I knew if I answered honestly, I was going to have a problem. So, 
there's so many people that just, they don't have to go anymore. They don't have to, so they don't. Well, you know, they did a major PR campaign uh, at some point to to depict Jesus a certain way, you know, that they thought worked. I mean, it's pretty clear, convincing evidence that he, he may have had uh, a female among his disciples. But you don't hear about that. It was kind of scrubbed out, right? They're all male. Uh, oh, Mary Magdalene. Yeah. Yeah. There's some people who believe his father might have been a Roman soldier. You know, that his whole, his, who his father was, biological father was, has always been up, to, up for debate. Well, wasn't it Constantine's grandfather or predecessor, two back from Constantine, the way the story goes, is they decided on some of those uh, details, what was going to go into the final uh, version of the Bible to release. Yeah, but even then, Joseph is not really considered to be his biological father because he supposedly never touched Mary. Okay, so he's out. <laughs> so God impregnated, well, God impregnated Mary somehow. Immaculately. <laughs> No, the reason I bring up the Roman soldier issue is that, you know, people are fighting now about, you know, what did Jesus look like? You know, was he the Jeffrey Hunter blue-eyed white guy or some Middle Eastern looking guy or maybe he was black? I mean, people are concerned about it. It's like, first of all, it shouldn't matter. What should matter is what he was trying to get across to humanity. You know, he's trying to teach us something. Uh, but then again, how how can anyone lay claim? Because we don't even know who his father was. We don't know what his father looked like. Uh, so he might have looked like a white person. He might have looked like a Roman. He might have looked like an Italian. He might have looked like a Middle Eastern. I don't know how he would look black, but maybe he could have looked black if his father was black. I mean, we yeah. don't know. Yeah. But it doesn't matter. No. But people are trying to claim, like lay claim to, well, Jesus looked like this or Jesus looked like that. It's like, why are you concerning yourself with how he looked? Do you understand what he was talking about? Because that's what he would probably prefer you talk about than his appearance. That would be nice if every teenager took a class just learning the basics of each religion. Which, you know, we, we, we run into a lot of resistance with that kind of idea as if, you know, uh, there shouldn't be any um, uh, infiltration of religion in school, in public schools at least. But I think that's, you know, first of all, it's a misinterpretation of the First Amendment. But if we teach comparative religion. At least give people the broad strokes so they know what's going on because right. Gen Z doesn't. Yeah, it's kind of they have no concerning. Idea. I don't know what's going on. Young, I mean, the young people that my family I'm raising, you know, I know, but um, I don't know what kids are getting. You know, it seems like that's why I think part of an education system, we're getting into materialism, and all that matters is how you appear, your skin color, um, financials, you know, how much money you have, whether you're part of the oppressive class or the oppressed class. Uh, so we're getting, you know, we're competing. I mean, there is a competition for, for the soul of, of humanity going on. And on the one side, you have the materialist. It's always been like that. You know, I get into it in the book a little bit about for and against the existence of God, the materialist views and the, the others, the rationalists and whatever. But um, in schools, you know, we're getting a heavy dose of Marxism. We're getting a heavy dose of class warfare and uh, racism and race consciousness. Uh, we're getting a lot of that uh, coming down on the kids, but, you know, we don't get the spiritual side. We don't get that, you know, beyond the skin. What's, what is, you know, when, you, when you're on the earth and you're alive and you're dancing and you're eating and then you die, what left? What's gone when you die? What was animating you? What was that? It's not the blackness. It's not the whiteness. 
It's not your skin color, you're Asian and you're whatever. It's not how much money you had. Something was animating that body. And we need to find out a little bit more about that. You know, and, and we don't we don't really get to that. We're, we're stuck on these, these superficial, we're stuck on the shallow things. Uh, and, and we're not, you know, look at the, the amount of silly uh, uh, cosmetic surgery like Michael Jackson, someone who had everything, right? You would think. Um, you look at these Kardashians and you look at the culture, we're looking at it and it's like, we're wearing masks, you know, uh, people, it's like we're so um, worried about exterior, you know, uh, appearances and, and you know, what kind of car does the person drive and, you know, all that stuff. And we're getting plenty of that in the school, but this other stuff that, you know, we're talking about today, we're not getting much of that because there's this idea that you got to keep God out of the public school. So if you if you take out that, what are we left with? We're left with your sneakers cost less than mine. <laughs> right? That's what we're left with. We're left with materialist thinking. That's it. And and that's that is a little bit frightening because as you mentioned the, the new generation I I don't know what's what's happening with that. Uh, but it's it's certainly we we should be at least introducing them to the idea that, you know, there's more to life than just, you know, money and appearance. You know, there's, there's something special about being here. And there is something animating your body. And when you leave this body behind, what was it? What was it? They never even think about that sort of thing, uh, especially if they're brought up strict atheist. A friend's uh, mother passed away a couple of years ago. We end up at a Catholic church for the funeral service. 12, 13-year-old nephew of hers is there. He's never stepped foot in his church, in a church in his whole life. Mm -hmm. It's completely foreign to him. And now here he is uh, listening to this priest. Mm. <laughs> He's he talking about going to heaven or something, right? He's he fainted in the middle of it. He fainted? He went down like a ton of bricks, hit his head on the floor. You, th uh, you think it was, you think the, the whole, the, the ideas that were being conveyed just, just overwhelmed him and he just yeah, passed out from it? Yeah. Just, uh, just entertaining the ideas of like a soul or this person going to a better place or something, or God existing or having a plan for, for people uh, after this? I think it's possible the ideas being presented by the priest overwhelmed him because he had never been exposed to that sort of thing before, and he just had this existential crisis in the middle of the service and just knocked him right over. Wow. At least I was nearby, and that's kind of the way it looked to me. Here's another thing that I've noticed, too. It could be related that, you know, we were talking earlier about living in cities. You know, we live in a, in a way that we are very insulated from death, from the reality of death. We're, we're very insulated. We, when someone dies, we don't see them die. We don't, we're not with them when they die. They die most of the time, and their body is taken to somewhere else, right, where it's dealt with. And then the next time we see it, it may be in a casket or maybe it's just cremated or whatever. So we've insulated ourselves from this whole process of death and we don't like it. We don't like people as they're dying. We don't want to be part of that. We don't like it. It's unpleasant. When they die, we don't want any part of that either. And afterward, we, you know, we're just glad they're gone and we don't have to deal with it anymore, right? So the death, we don't deal with death. And one of the things I found that uh, living in the, the Catskills is that death is very uh, normal. You know, you'll see the deer on the side of the road. Uh, I once came upon a blue jay that was, it died. But I took a picture of it. It was gorgeous, beautiful. Its wings were spread. It was looking up into the, the sky. It was the most beautiful thing. So I took a picture of it because I, I think that, that death is, is a very valuable thing. And maybe this kid never really confronted death. You know, the idea that you're not going to be here forever. You're, you're going to go. 
uh, is a very powerful thing. And it's very much tied into spiritual liberation. You know, as we talk about being born again, the idea of dying to your attachments, right? So if you treat your your children, your spouse, or your possessions, uh, if you're clinging to them, you know, that's a lot of tension in your life. You know, you're holding on to all the stuff. But when you can, when you die, you let go of everything. I had to euthanize my dog years ago, and I was at the vet, and this vet said, you know, you, if you keep this dog alive, it's only selfish. It's for you. This dog has no quality of life in you. I said, okay, go ahead and do it. They injected the dog. And as I was watching him, his face had been all crinkled up. You know, his face relaxed as he died. And he looked like a puppy. He was 17 years old, but he looked like a puppy again, so relaxed. And then I, you know, I watched him die. I saw that he relaxed. And if you can do this while you're alive, right? If you can look at yourself, you look at your life, you look at all the things that you're attached to, and you can see yourself not being there anymore. If you can imagine being dead, so that everything you've accomplished, everything you own, all your loved ones, all your attachments, gone forever, just gone. If you can put yourself in that place, it's liberating. It's very liberating because you're no longer holding on. You're no longer fighting. You're no longer, you know, at, you know, struggling to, to do this or that. And if you can do that daily, just regularly, have that attitude toward all things and all people. So you see your child off to school and you say, this might be the last time I ever see this person. You make sure they know you love them. You make sure you know, they know how much you want to be with them. At that then, right then, not 10 years from now, right? With regret that you didn't do it. But right now, show them how much you love them because nothing's guaranteed, right? We're not guaranteed another minute here. So to live more fully, you have to die. It's a kind of a paradox. To live more fully in the present, you have to let go of the past. You have to let go of your projections of the future. You have to let go of all of the things you're holding on to. you got to be psychologically able to die. Not physically, psychologically. And let go of all that. So now you're here. And you're here now, you're present. And now when you're saying, putting your kid on that bus, you're in a different mindset. You're not thinking about, after they get on the bus, I'm going to go to the sh shop and, you know, and I'm going to, you know, and, and, and they're just another thing to deal with. You know, you, you're with that child there then, and you're making sure this could be the last time I see my child. Something could happen on the bus. Something could happen to me. It's not that you're living in fear of things happening but you're living with the reality of death. The reality, not the fantasy death, not the death that's never going to happen to me. It's going to happen to you, right? Let it happen now. Don't wait for it. Let it happen today. Die. Go die, right? This is what Jesus was telling people. Just give away everything you own and follow me. Right? Isn't that what he said? Give it all away. Follow me. He's not saying follow me, like worship me. Look at the way the world the way I'm looking at it. Right? That's follow me. Not go to church every Sunday. Follow me, my example. Look, I'm trying to show you. Right? Follow me. So die now. Today. Right now. Die. Forget about everything. Let go of everything. So that's... When the, the kid fainted, I mean, you know, maybe he, he first he had his first encounter with the idea that death is real. And some people are not prepared for it. But if we can, if we can communicate to people the value of death, because life and death are this, right? They're together. You can't go anywhere and not see death. I see death everywhere. And people are like, you're crazy. I don't see it as negative. So if I'm looking, I'm driving along and I see trees, I see dead limbs among the other limbs. Yeah, just part of the circle of life, right? It's, it's, there's no life without it. Life and death are together. We separate it. I'm alive, I die, right? We separate it. 
because we can do that with our minds. We can separate it. Animals don't separate it. Animals are always aware that they can be dead any second. You watch an animal on the ground, a squirrel, they're constantly watching for the hawk. They're looking for food, right? Because they want to live. They want to live, but they know death is real and a second away, right? It could be taken like that. Animals are very aware of death and they're very alive because of it. They're very engaged in living. We are like in a different place, right? We, death is over there. It, you know, I don't have to deal with it today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pretend that I'm never going to die and I'm going to go about my business and my plans and whatever I'm doing. And I don't have to think about death. Yeah, because life for most of us, especially in this country, has, been, has become so safe. Mm -hmm. We're able to compartmentalize like that. We can get away with it yeah. a lot more than we used to. But what's the price, right? The price is you're not really living. There's a lot of us walking around that are dead inside. And, and I talk about spiritual poverty in the book. We're dead inside. Spiritual poverty. Yeah, a friend of mine told me I should, uh, what do you call that, uh, copyright or, you know, uh, the term, spiritual poverty. Maybe you should trademark it. That's what he was talking about, yeah, trademark. Then call that the sequel. <laughs> right. But, you know, I've been, I've been into that for a long time. I was looking at a piece I wrote in 1985 uh, when I was on my way out of the church, and I actually described the same thing. So it's nothing, it's not new to me. I've been very aware of the deadness inside, you know. Uh, that we're, we're walking around with. We can look at a beautiful sunset and feel absolutely nothing. And that's sad. It's really sad. We get, we get so little out of life yeah. where there's so much, you know, and that's the essence of what, I, what I'm experiencing and I'm talking about in this book is that there was so much in that moment. It was so beautiful and so joyful and happy that I realized the rest of my life was like the lights are out. Compared to that, I mean, I'm not even alive. That's how strong it was. And, and so that's why I'm, you know, in my own life, I'm always trying to uh, understand, you know, how I limit, you know, my life, how I limit my ability to have joy and happiness, how I, how I murder it, you know, how, I, how I, I'm against it, you know. I'm against my own happiness. I'm against my own life. And so the, the concept of, like I say, dying psychologically, right? Not waiting for you know, my heart to stop beating, but to die now, is if you look at some of these spiritual teachings, it's right there. They talk about it in different ways, but they're talking about the same thing. Even Jesus was talking about it. But you know, people don't get it. They they did you know, they misinterpreted it and it got I don't know, it got mixed up and jumbled up with something else and then set out on the table for people, yeah. you know. But exactly. I'm sure if Jesus were here today, he would say, amen. Die now. Don't wait. Do it now. Take the time to look at your life, look at your, your relationships to everything, and say, it's all going to end. It's all going to go away. I'm not taking any of this with me and see if your life doesn't improve. Just try it. What are you going to lose? You're not actually dying, right? You're still going to be here, so you're not losing. It's an experiment. Try it. Try dying to everything now. Just try it and see what happens. You know, people want to commit suicide. They want to commit suicide. They're so depressed about their life, right? They, they have all these bad experiences, all these memories, right? The trauma. And, then, and they said, there's no way out. I can never make my life right. My life has been damaged so badly, I can't fix it. I'm going to kill myself. Well, go ahead. Kill yourself here. Not here. Just here. You can commit suicide in a productive way by dying to everything you've known and, and, and everything you're attached to in the moment right now. You can do that. And you still have all your things. And you still have your loved ones, but you have a freedom from all that attachment, all those things that are holding you, right? All those limitations around you. You, you cut through it. You cut through it and you're free. 
Well, what a moment. Al Gart, thank you so much. His book is out and you can get it. Thank you for listening to the Creative Loitering Podcast. Don't forget to ring the bell and subscribe and like and comment below and enable notifications and click the heart and leave a review and swipe right at Patreon and OnlyFans and make a donation and follow me on Facebook and Snapchat and Instagram and Twitter and WhatsApp and WeChat and TikTok and QQ and QZone and Reddit and Twitch and YouTube and Vimeo and Pinterest and Pinterest. It's, uh, it's not for everybody, I know that. My, like I talked to my daughter and she just started putting on her music. Yeah. <laughs> I think you got some good material though, because I, I said I said some stunning things. Even I was stunned by, like when I talk about dying now. I mean, <laughs> I, was, I no, never said it got, that way. That's the thing we got that in camera. That's like remember I was telling you. This book is out, and you can get it.